Good evening, I'm Brian Reagan. This is Tyler Kelly. And we welcome you to Esther chapter 7 for our Twilight Talk. Tyler? So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, and on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request to put up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Queen, answered, Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, that covered Haman's face. Now Harbana, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows fifty cubits high which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and then the king's wrath subsided. All right. So... It didn't have to go this way for Haman. Haman could have just been chill and been like, dude, I don't like you. You you are loathsome and detestable to me, but you do right by the king, so you stay on your side of the king's gate. I'll stay on my side of the king's gate. And let us never mix at the king's gate. And some people, <gasps> no, that's fair. There are some people you just don't like. You don't have a good reason not to like them. There's just something about them you don't like. Big whoop. Stay on your side. They stay on their side. Let the two sides not mix. And go on with your business. Be content with what you have. Haman, Haman had a good position. Haman had a good life. But because he could not get past Mordecai. And so you're saying, is this saying, well, yeah. You know, king eats supper. They've eat their supper. King's happy, had a little bit of wine. What can I do for you, my wife? And she tells him. Now, why Haman thought that crawling up on, on what we would call a daybed kind of reclining couch and laying half on top of Esther <laughs> to beg her? Seriously, dude, you're laying half on top of the woman. <laughs> you know, the top half of his body and his, his head is probably right there at her navel for, for how the language is there. <laughs> on what level did you think this was going to work or look good when the king who walked out to the garden walked back in? <laughs> Another point, you built a 50 foot high, a five story gallows that was obviously visible from other places in the city. And the eunuch isn't stupid. I, the eunuch has learned to love Esther because Esther, Esther is a good lady. <laughs> the eunuch goes, hey, king, see that 50 foot gallows over there? Haman built that so he could kill Mordecai on it. <laughs> the king goes, you know, fair deal, bro. Go hang him. And, uh, and why? The old English proverb, which is a variation of the biblical proverb, he who digs a pit shall one day lie in it, goes back to the vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says the Lord. When you make a plan for other people's vengeance, you run the risk of setting your own vengeance up. Everyone has failures. Everyone has junk in their life 
that they aren't overly enthused with. Setting other people up for failure will only end up jacking you over in the end. Um, and so this is Haman's downfall. His inability to be content and his desire, his non-stop desire for constant revenge. And not just against one guy, but against an entire segment of an empire. So, other thoughts, my brother? Uh, it also begs the question, I'm assuming that means that um, the king did not read the decree to figure out which particular set of people, because Haman's extremely vague with who he addresses as the ones who are all getting killed off at the end of this decree, whereas the king seems to at least be aware that Mordecai is Jewish. Yeah. Um, and so I'm assuming that the king would be less likely to... Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the king doesn't read any of this. It's just like it, Mordecai, or Haman said so. Put the stamp on it, regardless of the fact they haven't read it. And, uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of the way that uh, laws went into effect, because we're used to our style, but, you know, Ecclesiastes 8, 4 says, where the word of a king is, there is power. When a king decrees something, then it's written down as law. In America, we're the exact opposite. We write down a law, then we debate it, then we vote it. And so a law in our world is very different. So hypothetically, it's supposed to have been read before it's enacted. So when Mordecai makes it, not when Mordecai, but when Haman makes his presentation to the king uh, against them, and the king says, let it be so, Right? Yeah, no, he didn't. And, and, and some people, that's not very good leadership by a king. Well, when was the last time you ran an empire? You know, one of the things about leadership, you cannot manage every single detail as you move up to higher levels of leadership. You, you have multiple layers and the people at the top layer closest to you, what we would call a cabinet. A president, frankly, a president cannot take the time to understand everything that comes across his desk. There is so much junk that comes across his desk. So if XYZ cabinet member is standing there and says, here's the gist of it, he goes, yeah, that sounds good. Signs it, boom, off it goes. Now it's a law. And, and so not very different. Um, and yeah, you know, but when people are like, well, they should take time because I know you know. <clears throat> Some of these things that get passed as laws or as bills are multiple thousands page documents. What a president actually signs is the summary that is actually generally nothing more than the title of it, the House number, the Senate number, and his signature for what the House and the Senate have already passed to send as law. And unless a cabinet member or a close advisor says, no, you don't need to sign it because, and they show him something in it, they just, yep, sounds good. So very similar kind of thing. So, good thought. Anything else, my brother? That's it. All right, with that, we bid you good night. Lord willing, we'll see you in the morning.